بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أحبت في الله knowing how to deal with differences and understanding differences is very important for us as believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and more specifically this is very important for Ahl Sunnah because due to understandings, different understandings, different approaches to understanding the religion, those are some key reasons why we have differences of opinion. And when we refer to these ikhtilafat, these differences, the differences that I want to concentrate on specifically now, we're talking about thiqiyya differences in fiqh understanding. So, of course, that puts aside the differences in i'tiqad because that's ghayr mu'tabar. That's something we don't even consider. We only consider and acknowledge the madhab of Ahl Sunnah. We study the other madhahib, meaning the other manahij, uh, ways of looking at aqidah for the sake of refuting those ways which differ with the creed of the Qur'an and the creed of the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the creed of the Salaf of this Ummah. So when we talk about differences, we need to understand how do we deal with these differences. One of the things we have to know is we have to acknowledge, we have to understand, should we really concern ourselves with every difference that we hear, especially between the ulama, the ulama of Ahl Sunnah. So that's the first question. And of course, to make it concise, is no, you don't have to involve yourself in every single issue, every time someone is refuted. So this is from uh, about sp specific issues, but every single issue you don't have to involve yourself in. Some issues are way above us, some issues don't concern us, uh, some fitna has not reached us, and we should not busy ourselves with it. So one of the types of differences that we face is differences regarding individuals. So for example, some of the Mashaykh may talk about, some of the Mashaykh of Ahl Sunnah may talk about another Sheikh of, of Ahl Sunnah. And I can think of countless examples, but I prefer not to name some of the differences and things that, fitna that we face right now between some of our ulama. But there are countless situations where a group of our ulama maybe refute a particular scholar that is known that was known for their Salafi and known for adhering to the Quran and the Sunnah and the Madhab of the Salaf but maybe they fell into some errors or perhaps maybe the people exaggerated their mistakes or whatever the situation is it's not for us to get into every single issue every single fitna translate every fitna to everyone and busy the youth who have their own problems and their own fitna to deal with, their own trials and tribulations to deal with. That's the first thing. So that's one type of difference. And regarding this difference, it can be for several reasons. It could be a difference based on personal issues. Sometimes it's shaksiya. Sometimes it happens. Because no one, the Prophet ﷺ said, All the children of Adam make mistakes, and the best of those who make sins are those who repent. So that means even the ulama, they fall into error, they fall into sin. Even the ulama, some of them fall into their hoa sometimes. Sometimes they refute someone, and it might not necessarily be based on knowledge. Maybe there is something in their heart, because their hearts are as the hearts of human beings, because they're human beings, and they make sin. So no one is free from mistakes, and this is not to belittle the ulama, but this is, we have to put things in perspective. So sometimes those differences can be based on personal issues. Sometimes those differences can be in understanding of the evidences, of the delil. Sometimes those differences can be with regards to tatbiq of those evidences, you know, how we practice or implement certain issues or when to implement certain messiah. 
And so these are very broad topics and I'm just going to try to give us a general understanding and stick with the point is how do we deal with these differences. But we need some background about this. So that's one point that we have to look at is we don't always need to involve ourselves, especially if we're not students of knowledge or we're beginning students of knowledge or whatever, in every type of fitna and every time someone's being refuted, whatever. That's one situation. The second type of, uh, the second issue I want to uh, highlight is some of the types of differences. And this is with regards, uh, specifically, I want to talk about with regards to fit. So you have, and this is going to be as basic as we can make it, because these topics, whole books and volumes have been written about. You basically have, generally you could say, two types of major differences. Sa'ig wa ghayda sa'ig. Sa'ig meaning that it's something that it's uh, perhaps a permissible uh, difference within fit that there's evidence for differences of opinion. And with this, you generally don't take a harsh stance with a person who differs with you. So it's very important for us to understand this. So not every issue, for example, talking about the niqab, wearing niqab, covering the face, or uh, maybe uh, the position of the hands on the chest, or many, many differences, in, and we're talking about issues of fiqh, that you'll find differences with the ulama of the sunnah, from the, and even the salaf of this ummah, beginning with the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in. Not every issue had, uh, uh, every issue was consensus. But rather, you'll find differences in many, many masail of fiqh, and we're going to give you, uh, verify that statement with one of our great ulama of this time, rahmatullah alayhi, rahmatul wasiyah. So that's the first type. The, the second type of difference is ghayr sa'id. This means these are differences which require generally a stronger stance because maybe one of the parties is differing with the evidence for whatever reason. So that means it's not an issue that it, it related to fit, which is so broad that every uh, statement, you know, it goes against clear, clear Nas, for whatever reason, maybe the Dalil didn't come to that great Imam and he has uh, a particular statement with regards to an issue. For example, maybe saying Amin after uh, Surat al Fatiha aloud in the congregational prayer. So, with this, uh, you'll find that some madhabs do not say that, they make inqar of that. But we have very strong evidence in a hadith that this was uh, one of the Sahabi said, I played behind, prayed behind, I prayed behind Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. I think he said, and I think he, he stopped there. And he said, all of them said, Amin, uh, aloud, you know, after Fatiha. Letting us know that this was the Sunnah of the Prophet and the Sunnah of the Sahaba. So this is very strong evidence. So to have a, a, a view contrary to that uh, not just presents a problem, but the evidence is very, very strong. So perhaps, and Allah knows best in this issue, and there's plenty of other issues, where the issue may be later side. Maybe it's, a, not, in, it's not permissible to go to, to have a, a view uh, contrary to that view, and I'm not sure if that was the best of examples, but just to give us a uh, tasawwara of this this whole mas'ala of ikhtilaf. Some issues I want us to look at really quickly, and I'll be as brief as we can. Before we get into that, let's look at something very important. Here's what Ben Uthameen said about the issue uh, when he was referring to, uh, in his book, in Usul of Fiqh, where he referred to the meaning of Fiqh as far as a, not a linguistic term, but as a sharia term. He said, Istilahan ma'rufta ahkama shari'iyya amaliyya bi'adilatiha tafsiliyya tafsiliyya He said that fiqh, that it is understanding the, the sharia rulings, the practical sharia rulings, if you want to say, with their uh, specific evidences. This is what fiqh is which is different to usul of fiqh and which is different from qawaid fiqhia. These are other sciences which are very related to the similar science, but they are furur, maybe, of uh, fiqh. And so, 
what I want us to, to, to what I want to highlight here, then he explained it in his book. He said, Well Marad be kolina ma'rafa. He said, and what is meant by our statement of of, of understanding Ahkam Sharia, he said, uh, this entails knowledge, uh ilm wa dhan. Knowledge and dhan. And then he said, لِأَنَّ إِدْرَاكَ الْأَحْكَامِ فَقِيَةً قَدْ يَكُونْ يَقِينِيًا وَقَدْ يَكُونْ ظَنِّيًا كَمَا فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنْ مَسَائِلَ الْفَقْهِ This is impaired, this is the, the shahid. So he said that when we say understanding Sharia rulings, that these Sharia rulings, meaning when we come to issues of fiqh, of understanding fiqh, it is broken into two, uh, this includes two, you could say broken into two parts. Ilm which is yaqini, yaqini and ilm dhanni. So this is knowledge which is based on certainty, meaning like it's, uh, in the fuqaha there's no disagreement that salat is fard al -ayn. That the prayer, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa qimu salat. And there's countless ahadith, you know, in the hadith of, uh, of, Jibreel alayhi salatu salam when talking about what are the uh, uh, the arkan of Islam and of course salat is one of them so this lets us know this right here is al yaqiniyan that there's no doubt no difference no doubt about this you know it's it's certain that this is a hukum shar that it is an obligation upon every muslim to fulfill that is, of course, uh, fulfilling the needs that, that they're saying, etc. So, that is a for sure ruling. The other type is vanni. And then, the point I wanted to mention here, uh, Imam bin Uthimi, rahmatullahi he said, because understanding these sharia, uh, these fiqh rulings, it could be yaqini, you know, certainty, and it could be vanni, based on probability. You know, that it is, uh, there's some room for error. It's not 100% certain. And then he said, and this is very important, kama fi kathir min fiqh. He said, as is the case with many fiqh, many of the fiqh issues, meaning most fiqh issues are vanni, not yaqini. Letting us know this is one of the reasons why you have, for example, what we know from Ahlul Sunnah, what we generally acknowledge the four madahib, and many other uh, aqwal with, uh, with regards to great imam and mujtahideen. But generally the four madahib that we accept as Ahlul Sunnah, the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, and Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah Jameer. So that lets us know that when you say, oh, the Hanafi, we do this, or the Hanbali, we do this, or what have you, that many of those issues are dhanni. They are based on their understanding of the evidence, and this is why they believe such and such uh, issue should be implemented this, or why it's an obligation, or why it's mustahab, or what have you. So that means there is, of course, room for much ikhtilaf in issues of fiqh. We're not talking about aqidah. And we're not talking about minhaj, methodology. So this is very important for us to understand. Let's look at the thing I want to uh, emphasize here is that Ahlul Sunnah, they deal with each other, the Imams, they deal with each other sometimes with shidda and sometimes with re, with lean wa rifq, with gentleness. Because the asl of how we should deal with these differences between Ahlul Sunnah, especially Salafi scholars and Salafi uh, 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 and uh, students of knowledge and, and what have you, is with gentleness. This is how the asl in, in the Sharia for the Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu said to Aisha, he said, Oh Aisha, verily Allah is kind and loves kindness and confers upon kindness which he does not confer upon harshness. Letting us know that when we have these differences, we should not rush to be harsh especially in issues of fit. That if you see someone doing something that your masjid is not familiar with your masjid, this one is moving the finger, this one is making circles with the finger, that 
I'm not saying they're all correct, but not to be harsh in how you deal with your brothers and sisters because you don't, you rarely achieve the maqsa, you rarely achieve the goal which is to bring the Muslim hearts together by being harsh. It's rare. It can be. Some people, the sternness helps to bring them back in certain issues, but the asl is lean, warifq, and many of the a'imma will uh, verify this. The pro and most importantly, it goes back to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, and these are hadith from Sahih Muslim, when kindness is found in anything, it beautifies it, and when it is withdrawn from anything, it becomes defective. So when you're given advice, if you are harsh, uh, you know, and it related the difference, then it becomes defective generally. This is not 100% all, in all cases, but generally this is the asal is being gentle and kind with one another. The Prophet said, whosoever is deprived of kindness is in fact deprived of good. This is also Sahih Muslim. So this lets us know that gentleness is encouraged in Islam and even how we difference, differ with one another. Lean uh, warif. So we should be respectful and do our best to strive to adhere to the evidence if we're able to do so. And looking at the statements of the Salaf and the great Imams uh, of the Deen, and it shows you uh, some, some examples I want to give you with regards to contemporary issues. For the first example is Imam Al-Albani, Rahmatullah during his time when he wrote his book about the niqab, you know, about uh, the, the hijab of the woman. And I just want to read a little bit of his statement. This is another great muhaddith, Sheikh uh, Tawajri, uh, Sheikh, um, uh, Sheikh Tawajri, I can't think of his name, Wallah Musta'an, right now, Hamad uh, Al-Ansari, no, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Tawajri, Rahmatullah Ali. So, one of the great Imams of Ahl Sunnah, Muhaddith. Imam Al Bani, he made some strong statements about the Sheikh. And they had their disagreements. But it was well known that they also had sittings after that and they gave one another the fullest respect, even though they had strong differences about the niqab. Here's what Imam Al Bani said in some strong statements, but that did not call to, cause to hazard. This is what we have to understand. So, us as regular people, don't break into his beer. Don't say, well, our masjid prays with like this, or our masjid takes this position about this uh, sheikh or this student, and then such a strong mokah that you make tashdeed and harshness with your other brothers from Ahl Sunnah. No benefit. Look at the, that's not, that's not what we see the example from our ulama. Even our ulama, we don't see this example, especially those, those jibab that have passed on before us and even some that are living. We don't see that they're so harsh. They may disagree, they may, may and call, uh, you know, uh, disagree with one another. And they may even do it sometimes with harshness and still have mahabba and still call one another. Not make it hajar of one another and not uh, attacking one another's honor, but rather they disagree. And they might refute each other with ilm. Here's what Imam al Abani said. To he said, Sheikh Tawajri claimed that scholars unanimously held that the woman's face was aura. And many who have no knowledge, including some PhD holders, have blindly followed him. Imam al Bani then said, In fact, it is a false claim, which no one before him has claimed. So here he's saying that the Sheikh has made a false claim. It's a very strong statement. He said the books of Hanbalite scholars, which he learned from, not to mention those of others, contain sufficient proof of his falsehood. I have mentioned many of their statements in Arad. For example, Ibn Hubayra, a Hanbali, stated in his book, Al-Ifsa, that the face is not considered aura in the three main schools of Islamic law, and he added it is also a narrated position of Imam Ahmed. The Sheikh is bringing his evidence or his statements, here he's just bringing the statements of the Salaf, to refute his brother. The point I wanted to mention here is showing that this is an issue that some of us we take for granted say, no, uh, the niqab is wajib. And some say, no, it's mustahab. Okay, I'm not trying to encourage you to take either position, but what I want you, the point of this video, is for us to understand how to deal with those differences? Am I going to attack my brother? He said uh, it's not wajib to wear niqab. He's causing facade in the community. He is a mubtadi. La! This is not the way that we should deal with these differences because these great imams didn't do that. 
These great imams did not do that. Another issue that I want to bring up and highlight, this is the issue with regards to uh, women visiting the graves. The ulama, so to keep this brief, the ulama, they have three different aqwa, three different statements with regards to it. These are ulama of the sunnah throughout time. Imam Anawi said, in his book Al Majmur, he said, so this is beautiful. Imam Anawi said most of the ulama, uh, and he said this in his book Al Majmur. He said, as for the women, he said, then the the author and other than him said, it is not permissible for them to visit the graves, and that is in accordance with the apparent meaning of the hadith. He said, however. What the jamhur, the majority of the ulama, take uh, hold in regard to the stance is that it's makru, and when they mean makru here, they mean makru or karahia tanzi, meaning that it is disliked, uh, disliked in the term that we usually define disliked, but it is not haram. And then he said, he uh, explained that walaset haramin, and it is not haram. So this, this is according to majority of the scholars. Some of our ulama, they take the position, no, it's impermissible. Here's a statement of Ibn Hazm, Rahmatullahi. He said, Imam Ibn Hazm, he said, that it is actually recommended to visit the graves. And he said that it is an obligation at least once to do this. You know, to go visit, visit the graves and, you know, make istighfar for the inhabitants. He said, and no problem with a Muslim going to the grave of his mushrik, you know, his non-Muslim uh, brother-in-law, you know, or basically relative. And he said, and of course not asking istighfar, but you know, maybe to remember moat, uh, remember death, it, it doesn't say, he doesn't mention. And he said, and women and men are the same in this, with regards to this. And then the ulama, they differ with regards to this, uh, this, and there's three different statements. We said some, they say, and I'm not going to get in depth into this issue, this is another piece of research in and of itself. Some say that it's permissible and they have their adilla. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Nahitukum an ziyaratu kubur fuzawruha. The Prophet Sallallahu said, I prohibited you from visiting the graves. And then he said, and then he made commands, so then uh, visit them. Meaning that in the beginning of Islam, before Tawheed was in the, the hearts uh, of the believers established firmly in Iman, at that time it was prohibited. But then when their Iman progress, their, their Iman grew, and their knowledge grew, and their Tawheed grew, then it became permissible. So showing that it was for a time. So this is what the first group, they uh, use as part of their Adilla. They have other Adilla. And so we've read some of the statements of the Imam. Some of the other, the second opinion, as we mentioned, was the uh, view that Imam Anoui said, and this is according to the Jamhur of the ulama, most of the ulama have this, is that it's disliked, but meaning it's still permissible. Okay? And they have their, their evidence from a hadith. And likewise, the third poll that say it's tahrim, they have their evidence. This poll, they have a, a, a lot of different adilla, you know, the hadith. Uh, one of the ahadith is Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la'ana zawarat al-kabur and this is in Sahih Tirmidhi so in this hadith in, in Tirmidhi uh, it says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, cursed those who uh, the, the females because he said zawarat al-kabur cursed those females who uh, visit the graves okay so th this is 
their evidence, some of their evidence, and they have others. They use the uh, many other ahadith, and we'll, we'll leave it there. But the point of mentioning all this to let us know that so many issues in fact there's differences between Ahl and Sunnah. The way in which we deal with those if di uh, differences is not by being making tashdeed of one another, attacking one another's honor, making ta'asab and prejudice, and wala taqlid and, and blind following, or tahazab, making hizbiya, falling into groups. Well, our group, the brothers in this masjid, we say that it's haram to go, we believe that all of, and that adillah, fine, there's nothing wrong with that. You take whatever you feel is the strongest adillah, according based on the ilm and fiqh, if you have it, or your imam, or what have you. Maybe you follow him because you don't have the ability to go and look into the issue. That's fine. It's just the issue of how do we deal with those differences. Do we attack one another's honor? And I'm going to end by this thing. There was a channel I came across on the YouTube, and it's, uh, you know, Hanbali Fiqh or something, uh, no, Hanafi Fiqh. And I think he's an Ashidi Diobandi, and he's, you can see he spent his time attacking Salafis. He brought some very nice knowledge-based Messiah in there, but he made mistake. He deceived his audience, and this was about the issues of putting the feet together. He deceived his audience, and again, this is not the place to go into depth about that issue. But the point is, it's not to be deceptive. Wouldn't it be better to present the evidence in a... a you didn't have to attack Ahlul Sunnah. That didn't have to be, you know, I don't have to present you, well, the Ahnaf, because we regard the Ahnaf, all the, the Madaib, they're from Ahlul Sunnah. They are the, the Salaf, they are the Salaf. And, but what we discourage is blind following, and we discourage Ta'asim, you know, prejudice, and we discourage, and going against the Adilla, just for the sake of preserving the whole, the statement of the Imam or a statement of anyone if it goes against the nasus, if it goes against the text, the Qur'an or the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu So that's what we discourage. So it's not about calling to you, calling to your view, but rather we have to understand how to manage these differences. I hope this was clear and I ask Allah the Almighty to accept my good and forgive our evil. Uh, accept our good and forgive our evil. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ala Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said that was incorrect from myself and the shaitan. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ala Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.